Father, we give you praise for this vessel that continues to empty itself out. And we give you praise because of what he does, oh God, you shall let the anointing continue to flow. The oil shall continue to flow. We thank you for this word that you have prepared through him tonight. Lord, we thank you that deep calleth unto deep. Lord, that you reveal mysteries unto us. All glory and honor belong to you. Amen, and so be it. Let us welcome the set man, this prophet, Pastor Moses Anderson. God is good. Thank you, Alan. God is good. Praise the Lord. All righty. Praise the Lord. God is good. Yeah, let us all be seated. Let us all be seated. Uh, let us all be seated. And I'm glad uh, at the scripture from James chapter 4, verse 4, that Manuel Leader read to us. Um... I'm excited about it because on Tuesday, might have been, remember that I mentioned either Tuesday or Saturday last week, I did mention that quite often when we read in scripture and we read about the, the strange woman, the adulteress, and, and we, we keep seeing that recurring in the book of, of Proverbs, also a little bit in Ecclesiastes. And we often wonder why so much mention to the temptress, right? And this is the reason why. James chapter 4 verse 4 that we have just read. The word in James, there, there are two, I mean, there are different sets of manuscripts that were translated to the modern James that we have. Uh, one of them, it might have been the NU text, does not include adulteress. I mean, does not include adultera. It just starts with adulteress. Right? But whether it is the adulterer or the adulterer and adulteress, it is from a word, uh, a Greek word called moikos. Okay, if you're Greek in the room and I've not said it right, please, I'm sorry. Don't wait for me at the door. That's just a fair attempt. And, um, and I think the feminine form of it is moikalis, something like that. But it's interesting because when Manuel Leader was led to read that to us, it reminded me of what I hinted on um, concerning the book of Proverbs and the strange woman, the temptress, and you know, you keep finding scriptures saying, oh, young man, do not go near the door of her house. Um, the, the people who go down to her go down to the pit of hell. And you keep wondering, why are there so many chapters about this one sin? You understand what I mean? But when you come to James chapter 4, what do you see? The Bible was talking about adulterers and adulteresses and it was followed by an instruction, a command given to the ecclesia, to the New Testament believers to not allow themselves to be in friendship or as we say, to be in bed with the world. Let me say that again. In fact, I think we should read it so that um, we can all be carried along. Let us quickly go to that James chapter 4. I, 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 as Manuel leader was praying and leading that prayer, I just knew in my heart that many of us would have connected better with it if we had looked at it or if we were able to look at it from that perspective. James is after the book of Hebrews. James chapter 4 verse 4. And what does it say? It says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The word translated adulterer, adulteress, like I said, is the root word moikos, and it means to not believe in God. <laughs> so <laughs> it's 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 interesting, isn't it? Because you find God constantly hammering the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, and God kept calling them harlots, calls them names like that. Why? Why would he say that? He even broke it down through Isaiah that you prostituted yourself to the world. You've been going to be with the world rather than be with me. The people who practice 
such infidelity in the natural give us a good picture of what we do with God. The moment God is no longer enough for you that you need to go and find joy, peace, and confidence somewhere else, you are committing adultery of the heart. Many of us don't realize it, but when God said to you that I have given my word and my word is enough for you, why are you still going about in your heart worrying? Because when the word of God has come forth, to say that I will deliver you. What are you supposed to do? Wait to be delivered. Don't go running elter skelter because every other altar that you go to seeking for what God has promised is called the altar of prostitution. And that is the reason why Hishta, Isis, the Canaanite goddess, all of the names that we know her by. Her temples are usually symbolized by all kinds of images of promiscuity. Simply because it is there as a way, it's a religion of, a, of unfaithfulness and many a times, many of us still practice it. Your heart and my heart belongs to the Lord. And so don't you see scriptures like this? I mean, I'm talking to all of us now because even myself for several years, until I started questioning it, I would read scriptures like that and I'm like, moving on. Especially when I was a teenage boy. I was a teenage boy. I wasn't married. I wasn't committing adultery. I'm like, eh, this doesn't apply to me. Maybe the man next door, who cares? You know, just keep going. But the reality of it is every single one of us who are named by God's name can be guilty of this if we are not even aware that there is a stumbling block, if we are not even aware of this requirement, if we are not aware of this holy expectation, we keep, let me tell you something, nothing in this life should pleasure your heart other than the promises and the faithfulness of God. I say that also because when you look at the book of Proverbs in about two or three places in Proverbs, the, the young man was being given an advice saying, live joyfully with the wife of your youth all the days of your vain life and let her breast satisfy you always. And you read that and you're like, okay, I'm a, I'm a woman. This is not talking to me. Or you read that and you say, well, I'm a man. My wife satisfies me and you keep going. But the reality of it is that when we examine the part of you that matters the most, your heart and your eternity, you are not being satisfied with the wisdom of God. Because the book of Proverbs continually contrasted two women. The woman that was called the wisdom of God and the woman that was called the temptress, the, the strange woman or the adulteress. All those three were still referring to that urge within us to depart from God, chasing pleasure, chasing fulfillment, chasing a little bit of, you know, sometimes we just want to have a different feeling. But the reality of it is that God is everything that you need and we're constantly being tested to see if God is enough for us. God is looking for people that he will spend eternity with. If you are not fully satisfied with God, eternity for you will be a torture, will be like hell because for all of eternity you have no other beloved but him. You know God does people a favor by allowing them to perish. You see, because sometimes we think that when God says, when Jesus says, whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life, we think, oh, God is being mean. Why do you need to destroy the ones that don't believe in you? Did you not make them? He made us so that we can have an opportunity to choose whether we want to be his family forever. And so the people who do not choose him and choose to be content with him, he allows them to be destroyed in the lake of fire. Remember the lake of fire, according to scripture, is going to be torment for beings that are already eternal beings. The Bible listed in the book of Revelations, the beings who are going to be in hell forever and who are going to get tortured, they are already eternal beings. We are mortals. We don't live forever unless we believe in the Lord Jesus. So if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus and you get thrown into hell, into hell because you are not eternal, you get destroyed. That's what Jesus said. He said, don't be afraid of the one that can destroy the body, the facade. He said, but more be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in the lake of fire. 
And so God just says they will perish. We will eliminate them because why make them subject to the beauty of eternity when they do not have an appreciation for it? The world is going to pass away, folks. And so when God is telling us to divorce ourselves from mammon, from the system, and from worldliness, and from the cares of this world, he's telling that to you so that when the world passes away and you remain, you will not be missing the world. Eternity is too long a time for you to be missing the world. So do yourself a favor today and sever ties with the world because one day the world system will cease to be. The idols that entertain us today, the idols that keep beckoning to us and the idols that get our attention, affection and commitment, they will cease to be and if you haven't dealt with your heart, you will be on your way to the promised land and still looking back at Egypt. Everything that God does, he does out of his love. The Bible says God is love. If you cut him this way, he bleeds love. If you cut him that way, he bleeds love. And he's demonstrated that to us again and again. John 3, 16, Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave. So every time they were cutting Jesus up, love was all that could come out. And that is the love that brought us in to the family of God. And so when you see those things that God said that he would do without the understanding of God being love, Sometimes you will question God's heart. That why would God punish people like that? You know many of us, until recently that God started speaking to us, we initially came to God because we were afraid of him. Maybe not afraid of him, afraid of his judgment, the way we were told. Do you know that there are so many people and when you, when you talk to religious people, what do you find? Or you talk to people from other religions outside of Christianity, what you find is that majority of people who practice those religions are there because they're afraid of the punishment. You understand what I mean? There are so many religious Christians today who come to church because they don't want to go to hell. They give their tithes because they don't want to be broke. They pray to God because they don't want to get in trouble. You understand what I mean? Everything they do is out of the fear of torment. But you will not find that in scripture. You will not find anyone who had a relationship with God all through the 4,000 years of recorded history that we call the scriptures who related with God successfully because they were avoiding trouble. What does the word of God recommend? The word of God says whosoever must come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, not a punisher of those who don't seek him. <laughs> so many of us, we, not the people here, those that we watch eventually, because I know that we're here because we love Jesus. You see, we have to learn that there is a big difference between coming to God because of the fact that he's a lover coming to God because of the fact that he wants me, come, I come to him because he made me to be with him and that is the reason why I am coming to him as opposed to, well, I'm going to be here because the people who are outside, you said you're going to kill them. That means I don't want to be here, I'm just here because I'm afraid. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Fear does not impress God. God does not like fear. And that's why some people are frustrated and angry at God because they have prayed and they have fasted. But every time they open their mouths to speak to God, they are speaking out of their fears. They keep saying, do you not care that we perish? Why would you go that route when you could go to him and say, I thank you because I know you see what's going on and I'm so eager to see the big surprise that you have at the end of the day because you're not going to leave me stranded. I know you. That is a different prayer to accusing him for neg of negligence. I know that you are so spiritual, you have never opened your mouth to actually say, God, why have you neglected me? But your actions show sometimes that you think that God has forgotten you. Every time you bite that self-help book and you throw that pity party, what you're saying in essence is, God, you have forgotten me, so I'm just going to be here feeling sorry for myself until maybe one day you remember me. But the Bible says that shall a woman forget her suckling child. That was Jesus speaking. He says, even though they may, yet I will not. God never forgets. 
<laughs> Come on now. And so, there is no reason ever for our hearts to play the harlot because the one who is our beloved loves us with an everlasting love and he wants us to love him in return for our own good because he knows that this world system is not going to last and the only thing that will last is the only thing that has always been and that is God himself. He knows that he is the only one that we will have for eternity so he wants us to come to terms and be in agreement that we are okay with just having him. You know, I've, I said this jokingly about two years ago, that people who don't know how to sing and dance before God are signing up for an eternity of trouble. Because if you are not happy being in the presence of God, and God is saying that I will make my habitation with the sons of men, and I will dwell with them forever. In Zion, the new heavenly Jerusalem. God is saying, I already told you, the reason why I made the entire system, I created everything, is because one day I want to come and dwell with my people forever. So you already know. So if you already know that that is your eternity, why can't you just get excited about it? So if you can't be excited with spending 10 minutes in worship, then you want to spend 10 gazillion years? Think about it. You may be better off just choosing to be perished or to be destroyed. Because it doesn't add up. It doesn't make any sense. And that is the reason why God continues to give us test after test. Allows for us to go through experiences after experiences. So that we can develop that appreciation for him. Because if we don't, he is telling you what he knows. He knows the time will come wherein everything will pass away. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away. But one thing that will remain is that word of God. All that will remain is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Are you happy being? with them forever? If your answer is yes, praise God. But if it is no, you might as well just sign up for hell. Quick destruction. Get it over with. You know, the torture that is even in time is already bad enough. You know, because people try to talk about hell and all that stuff. But I'm like, why are we even talking about hell? Why don't we talk about people's trauma? on the daily who live without God. Do you not know Christians who do not have joy? I'm sure you know at least one or two Christians. I use the word Christian because I like to make a distinction between a believer and a Christian. So those days that you are not truly believing what God says, you demote yourself to just being a Christian. You understand what I mean? Because you can't say you're a believer and yet you are questioning God. That means you don't believe because if you believe, then you don't ask questions. To believe is not to put a question mark where God has already placed the period. If God says, we're going to the other side, that's it, we're going to the other side. Even if the storm takes the boat, throws it up in the air, all you need to do is throw your hands up because it feels better with your hands up. That was a good one in case you haven't seen the movie. Yeah, what's that movie called again? Madagascar? Let's talk to people who are young in the room. Jordan, you know Madagascar, right? Yeah, what's his name again? King Julian. They were crashing and everyone was panicking and he was like, oh, it feels better with your hands up. When I watched that thing, I laughed, but I also learned that quite often when God is doing something exciting in your life, you are too terrified to enjoy it. Throw your hands up. What does that mean? Be in praise and worship. It feels better when you are being thankful than when you are being worrisome. Oh yes. When God is doing a thing, he says, let us go to the other side. That was the last thing Jesus told the disciples before they got on the boat. And when they got on the boat and there was a little bit of trouble, then they started looking at Jesus like, he don't care. His father is the Lord of all things, so he can sleep. But look at us. And that was why when Jesus was teaching them to pray, the first thing he said they needed to acknowledge while they're praying is our father. Because sometimes many of us, we worry like God is only the father, is only father to the pastor. And that God is only father to man or leader. Look at her life. You see what I mean? But he is our father. If he is your father, then what else do you need? Let us stop being wanderers, 
Many of us, we have chosen the life of a vagabond. We have chosen to live like Cain when in fact we could live like Seth. We've chosen to look for help where there is no help. Let me tell you something. I asked God after Tuesday's meeting, I said, God, I want us to talk about some things that people will consider practical. Because I've come to realize also with the help of my wife and the Holy Spirit, that some things that I think are practical, people don't think they are practical. Several times people have asked me, oh, how do you do this and do that? And I tell them, I pray. And they're like, yeah, 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 but after praying, what do you do? I wait. And people, in fact, I remember there was a time that we had a, a joint project that was a boutique consulting firm out of Minneapolis and they had an opportunity to bid on a job. And so they invited me to come along uh, because, you know, they needed the kind of expertise that I brought to the table. And so we, we got on the phone initially and spoke to the client. And I started smiling because I recognized the reason why they came looking for me because what the client was asking for would require a ton of research for someone who hasn't been thinking like that. Completely out of the box kind of thinking. And that's one of my favorite things to do because, you know, when I was young, they said I was weird and I decided, okay, I'm just going to stay the best weird form of myself that I can be. So I've enjoyed out of the box thinking. And so what did I do? I said, yeah, let's, let's make it happen. I, I will come, give me about 10 days. I'll do a presentation for you. So 10 days came. I did a presentation out there in, um, in Orange County, California. After the presentation, the owner of the boutique consulting firm who took me there, he says, let's have dinner tonight. I have some questions for you. So he said to me, he said, I've been doing this thing for years. I've had other consultants. He said, that is new. That is different. Where did you get that from? He said, you can be honest with me. We're paying you anyway. And I told him, I said, well, everything I said was from between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis 11. He was like, he says, um, I know what you're talking about because I was raised in the church. That was what he told me. He said till he was about maybe the age of 11 or 12, he went to church regularly. He says, so are you talking about the same Genesis that is the first book in the Bible? I said, yes. He said, okay, let me ask you the question again. What you were teaching, and he started naming certain principles from my slide. I said, yeah. I said, that one in particular is Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 4. He was like, I'm talking about some practical way by which you come up with this solution. I said, that's it. That is what I practice. Because the Bible says in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And the Bible says that that word is light. And so when people describe darkness to me, a problem they can't overcome, I just go to the source. I go to the light. And I ignite the light and become the light. And then the darkness has to disappear. I'm not sure how convinced he was, but he got born again. And from time to time, I would tell people some of the things that I think are practical, but to people, because my wife would say to me, you know that question they asked you on Friday? And we said, oh, can you give us a practical step of doing this and that? Everything you said is not particularly practical from the standpoint of many people. So I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, I need help because there are things that God's been revealing to me about that message from Tuesday. The message from Tuesday was purely prophetic. From the standpoint of, <laughs> Josephine can testify. It wasn't just a description. What is prophecy? Let's, let's quickly go there for one minute. What is prophecy? Prophecy is what? Let's define prophecy from the word of God. How does the word of God describe prophecy? The Bible says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Right? So the foundation and the core of prophecy is what? The testimony of Jesus. So if you have a commitment to testify of the Lord Jesus, what does that do? It allows for the wind that powers prophecy to be formed on the inside of you. Look at Jesus. Quite often the Bible says Jesus was moved with compassion and he spoke and they were made whole and they were made well. And so when you and I are moved with compassion to see the testimony of Jesus come into effect in the life of somebody and we do it out of a pure heart, we will prophesy. I got a message from my sister Kanita who is going to come up later on by the grace of God to share her testimony. We told her she was coming up. She says, no, I'm not. And Bonita said, yes, you are. 
And the moment her mom says she was, I said, yeah, you are. I added my voice to it. So she's going to come up here because she has a great testimony of the deliverance and the miracle of God. I mean, let's just, for the people who aren't aware, I want to help your appetite. She just got healed of cancer completely. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so, when the word of God came forth in here, that that which, in fact, I was speaking to my sister Z, but I know that other people tapped into it, that that which men have called terminal will be terminated. And so, whose report are we going to believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. People can say whatever they want. We know that the Lord has already spoken what we need. And we have to hold on to the word of God. And so she, she sent me a message and she said to me, thank you for declaring my healing. You see, because the healing came from the word of God. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says, let him who speak, speak as an oracle of God. If you cannot speak the word of God, it's not your turn. Just keep quiet. Because many of us, we see people going through stuff and they're like, have you been praying? They say, yes, me too. I've been praying. No result. No, don't be a Debbie Downer. If you cannot speak a word of encouragement to lift somebody up, and don't make up the word either. Don't make it up. Because the Bible says a false witness is an abomination, but the one who hears will speak expressly. Wait until you have heard. And if you're not hearing, that means you're too far from where God is speaking. So get close to God first before you pretend to be close to people. You know, some people want you to feel like they really care about you so much and they'll be saying stuff that they have not heard. They raise your hope and then you end up being disappointed. Or sometimes they even tell you a lie. They tell you that, oh, maybe you need to try this. You who is happy believing in God, then they start suggesting all kinds of quote-unquote practical things that you can do. And before you know what's going on, you are operating in the flesh and the Bible says to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So going back to prophecy, prophecy, the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the word of God that became flesh, is the spirit of prophecy. So when somebody prophesies, what they are speaking is the word of God. When somebody prophesies, what they're speaking is what? They're speaking the word of God. And so if we know that God operates through the ministry of his word, brings us healing by his word, what do we do? We speak the word and let the word go to work. Say it because God has said it and believe it. And so we're looking forward to receiving your testimony today and I know it's going to transform lives in here. It's going to energize someone else's faith. So I was telling you about the practical things. I saw the Lord. I said, please give us some practical things that people can relate to as being practical and begin to exercise in and work on. And one of the things that he said to me is this. He said, why don't you show them how I operate? Because what God is doing with some of us incidentally, is what is causing us frustration. You see, many of us, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to read, but I'm just going to encourage you to read Genesis chapter 1 when you get home, but I'm going to make references. Many of us are buried underwater, but we have consciousness. When God made man, man was not the first thing that he made. Because if God had come out on day one and made man, the man would last only two minutes and he'll be gone. Because where is the air for the man to breathe? Where is the land for the man to walk on? Where is the light? Where is the food? Every one of those things had to be made first before the man. But guess what? The man was already there. He was buried in the ground underneath the water. And God was like, don't worry, I'm coming. But I need to separate these waters. You don't know that they are not the same. They look the same, but this confusion, only I understand it. So I will separate the waters from the waters. The waters above will give you perspective. The waters beneath will give you 
peace and comfort. I am working on all of these things for you. I'm going to bring out trees that will produce food, fruits, and food for you. But you have to wait and let me sort it out in the order that is best. So what do we do? We see God separating the waters from the waters and we begin to cry. We're like, oh God, please don't take that water away from me. We have been together for seven years. We went to high school together. We got our first job together. Why is, why is this friend being taken away from me? And the Lord is saying, you thought you were meant to be together, but I know that some of these waters belong there while some of these other waters belong over there. The Bible says the waters above, he called heavens, and the waters beneath, he called seas. Some people are meant to be that far away from you as the sky is from the ocean. Some interests are supposed to be as far from you as the east is from the west. Your favorite body who goes to every sporting activity with you suddenly finds somebody else to go with and you're feeling rejected. No, that is God separating the waters from the waters because he needs for you to have a space to breathe. But if we don't know what God is doing, we will be frustrated at the same thing that is intended to get us liberated. You and I, from time to time, we're like that man underwater without understanding of what God is doing. And then God says, let there be light and there was light. And you were like, oh, finally, it looks like we're making some progress. But God left the light to be on its own for a while and the darkness to be on its own. And some of you get frustrated because you're like, God, why don't you just do away with the darkness completely? And you know, when you read Genesis chapter one, the Bible says God separated the light from the darkness. The darkness was still there. But God looked at the light and God says, wow, this is good. And then he separated the light from the darkness. Many of us are too eager to see certain things happen in our lives that we're not even willing to wait for God to say it is time. The Bible says God spoke first that the light was good before he separated the light from the darkness. Many of us, God has brought you out of one relationship and immediately you want to be in another one and God is saying, I haven't said that the light is good. Because if God hasn't said that the light is good and you try to move it to another direction, the darkness will follow it. Many of us, you know quite well that the mindset that you've been operating with, the moment you recognize that that mindset isn't working for you. Let me give you an example of somebody that I got to know about lately. This was a person who was operating under the mindset that money is so important that money has to come first. Because when they were growing up, somebody told them that money is the chariot to the gospel. That even if you want to preach the gospel, you need money. This person was raised with the notion that you need money for everything. They say, oh, you want to be nice to people. You want to give to the homeless. You need money. You want to spend time praying. You need money to first of all pay your bills. Otherwise, when you're praying, that's where your mind is going to be. So this fellow, I won't say whether it's a man or a woman, but this fellow has already bought into this mindset of money first and other things later. And God brought them help by helping them to receive an understanding that God and confidence in God comes first. So God has brought light but they have not yet received the endorsement of God to say that, yes, now you're good to operate with this new knowledge that you have received because that is what will separate the light from the darkness. Do you know what this fellow decided to do? This fellow decided to now start living their lives running away from money. They went to the extreme end of saying, you know what, money is nothing. They went to the extreme end of now living their lives always gravitating toward poverty and things that should not even be an issue now became an issue. Guess what happened? No gospel was preached. No lives were changed because they were running until God says it is good. Many of us, we go from one extreme to the other because we don't allow God to separate things from us. 
You see, one of the things that I have learned is this. If I were that person, maybe I shouldn't say that. This is God's expectation of us when we are in that situation. God's expectation of us in that situation is this. Begin with thanksgiving and say, Father, thank you for delivering me from that mindset. Now, what next? Because quite often, when God delivers us from one mindset, we now think, oh, okay, that's how you do with God? I'll take it from here. God does not want people who want to take it from here. You take it from here to where? If you have been that good at taking things from God and running with it on your own, then you would have done that in the first place. We need to wait and let God do all of it by himself. And once he has then done it, he would let you see the space that he has created for you to do yours. The other day I was painting and Ariel came to me. It was about a year ago or so. And she was like, oh, I want to help. And I looked at her and I looked at the beautiful job that I had done. And the more beautiful job that I was hoping to do, and I said, this is what we're going to do. I know you want to help. I didn't want to discourage her. In fact, if anything at all, I want her to learn. I want her to work alongside with me. You know, because many of us, what we do is we, we go to our children to play with them, but we don't bring our children to work with us. Many people, particularly in the West, spend so much time watching their children play. And now you wonder why they're lazy, why they don't want to do anything. Because all they ever did with you was have you watch them play. They never watched you work. And if they don't watch, how would they learn? So I'm always eager for my children to watch me watch. I mean, to, to watch me work. Joshua was barely four years old when I would encourage him to stay when I'm in business meetings. I'm like, no, don't worry, just stay there. Because she'll be picking up on things. So now you wonder where he got the idea from two years later when he was six of starting his own company. That's because he's listening and he's beginning to understand, okay, that it is not all about getting excited and running helter-skelter and spending money. Sometimes you have to make that money before you spend that money. Sometimes you have to settle down and think critically on how to solve people's problems as opposed to just enjoy ferociously the pleasures that other people have created. There needs to be that balance. And so Ariel came and I said, yeah, so this is what you're going to do. I will paint this place and then I want you to do exactly what I have done. I knew at that particular point in time it was very difficult for her to mess it up because I defined the perimeter for her to play in. I painted the, uh, what you may call it, the boundaries because I didn't want her splashing paint on the wall socket. I didn't want her painting the hardwood floor. So I created that perimeter and she could do whatever she wanted in that space and she was excited. She felt like she was ready to paint the Empire State Building. She felt like, man, I can paint anything at this particular point in time. And that is the way God deals with us. If we don't allow God to set the perimeter for us to play, we will think we have now become the God of the universe. You see, the way God deals with us is such that he allows for you, after some victory that you're getting really cocky about, to go through a very humbling experience. Because if you stay from, if you keep going from one win to another win, before you know what's going on, even God will be running to catch up with you because be like, God, man, you're taking your time. You're taking too long. I'm ready for that next assignment. And God is like, okay, so this is what we're going to do. We'll make you go on the mountain, down in the valley, on the mountain, down in the valley, so that ultimately you learn to wait for God. And for the physics people in the room, one of the best ways to have acceleration in life is not to travel on a flat land, but is to go up the mountain, down the valley. I'm sure you've seen those experiments. So if you want to move someone from, if you want to roll a ball from that wall to this wall, and somebody takes the ball and just rolls it on a plain leveled floor like this, it will get there after a ball that travels up on a hill. So if you create a mound here, a mound of dust, and you create like three or four of them, the ball that rolls up the hill, down the valley, up the hill, down the valley, will get to that wall before the ball that is rolling on flat land. Don't worry, don't, you don't have to imagine it. Go online when you get home and do the YouTube search. Balls, which ball is going to get there faster? The one that goes up the hill or the one that rolls on the plain ground. It's, it's a good exercise. You need, when you watch it and you see it, 
It makes you think about your own life and how you've been begging God to just make it easy. And God is like, when it's easy, before you finish, Jesus would have come and gone. I am bringing the mountains and bringing the valleys because that is what's going to help you gain momentum. You see, because when you're going up the hill, you know what it does for you? When you're going up the hill, it allows for you to consider the things that you're carrying that you do not need. Nobody wants to carry excess weight up the hill. No. Yeah, because if your life is one flat land, let me tell you something. Alexis, some of your friends from first grade will still be your friend today because it's not a burden. It's easy to just keep moving if everything is flat. You understand what I mean? Some of the music you used to listen to that was not getting in the way of your meditation on God's word, you would have still been listening to them. Why did you let go of those relationships and those habits and those things? Because while you were going up the hill, you said to yourself, I can't make it with all of this baggage. I need to lose some weight. I need to shed some habits. I need to, I need to fast. I need to let go of stuff. Because if God is saying to you, Diamond, oh, I need, to, I need you to give me that part of your wardrobe. Diamond will say, no, God, I don't want to let go of that dress. I know how much I paid for it. But guess what happens? God allows for you to go through situations wherein no one is even inviting you to go anywhere. And even when they invite you, you don't want to go because you're like, oh, I don't want to go to the party because that girl, we're not talking. This one, we're not in good terms. And see, God allows you to go through times like that so that eventually you will be the one to say, you know what, where is goodwill? I need to get rid of some party clothes because I ain't going to no parties. You see how God works? Because if God is saying to you, bring it, you will resist. So what does he do? He allows for you to see an uphill situation in front of you so you come to terms with your own self and say, this, this has to go. Oh yeah, this has to go. There was a time that I used to hang out with friends all in the name of networking. You know, so I had this group of consultant friends. I'm like, man, because you know, no man was made to be an island. In fact, I had scriptures that justified what I was doing. You know, the Bible says, he who has friends must show himself friendly. This is, I'm showing myself friendly. So when they invite me, you know, at some ungodly hours to come and meet somebody, should I not have known that anyone that I cannot meet in the day is not of the Lord? The Bible says, they that sleep, sleep at night. Right? So if there's anybody that is not sleeping at night, okay, what is his mission? I'm not talking about people waiting up to... In this <laughs> Yeah, what is your mission? You understand what I mean? Like a thief in the night? Okay. But I would justify and say, oh, you know, we need to go. We need to meet people. And then I would go. And when you meet people at 11 p.m. And where you're meeting them is about to close down. Every place that opens after midnight is not for you. Even when we're doing all night prayer meetings, we try to start like 10 o'clock. We don't open it at 1 a.m. I mean, you already know what I'm talking about. Those places that open at those hours of the night. But then I'll tell myself, you know, I'm already out of the house and the guy hasn't even dropped any good news yet. He hasn't said to me the source of that contract. I need to follow them to that place. Maybe he needs to drink a little and then he'll be more generous with information. You know, I keep encouraging him. You know how it goes, you know. And then, in fact, I will never forget. I rem this, this happened. I, I went from Canada, made a stop in Atlanta, and then we were told that there was a job in Lagos, Nigeria. And so when we got there, the guy who received me introduced me to the person in the daytime. He said, that's the guy. But during the day, nobody gets his attention. But we know the club that he goes to at night. This was in 2012, I believe. And so guess what? We went to that club at night. And then with the first bar that we went to, he started talking. The first thing he said was acknowledge that he was the man that we needed to be talking to. And we're like, wow, we've hit jackpot. This is awesome. He's the man. But then he wouldn't say anything else. Two hours later, everybody was just getting dr drunk and looking more confused. And I'm like, at what point is he going to say the rest of the stuff? And the guy said to me, he likes young women. I said, what has that got to do with me? They said, there's a place they're going to when he gets there and he sees them, he loses his mind and he starts talking. We got there, the only thing that he lost was his morals. He didn't lose his mind. He said absolutely nothing. By 3 a.m., I said I was going home. The guy was like, but we haven't heard it. I said, when you hear it, come and tell me. <laughs> Not long after that, this same consultant had to come back to America. It didn't work out. What is the essence of going after things when in reality we just need to go after God? 
But the reason why many of us aren't aware of it is because of the fact that we have this mindset that we need to separate ourselves from. I was going after these people and I was carrying all this weight with me until I faced a difficult situation. I was faced with a difficult situation so tough I knew no other way of going about it. A partnership that I had just gotten into that promised me heaven and earth made me give up everything else that I was doing disappointed me about 12 days later. It didn't even last for long. And so at that particular point in time, I had to examine myself. I started to think to myself, okay, what is going on? And then I heard God say to me, you know you're not supposed to be talking to that person about business because their heart is not where yours should be. God spoke very clearly, but then I couldn't shake off all of the connections that I knew in my mind that he has. And so I wrestled for weeks with what God had said. I continued having meetings, having meetings and meetings. To cut the long story short, everything they were getting out of me from that meeting, they used it to create an alternative image of me online and they were using it to sell their project and I was not aware of it. They created a separate company. They created, you know, a, a website. Everything was there until I went to bed one night completely frustrated because of the difficulties that I was going through and the Lord revealed to me their plan. And the Lord revealed to me also the end of their plan. And you know how God showed it to me? I found myself in one of the high-rise buildings that they used as a day office. And at that time, they hadn't even taken me there, but they had one. And so when, when I got to that in the dream, I saw the man who was my main contact person. He high-fived me at the door and he left very quickly like someone was running after him. I didn't understand what was going on, but I was like, well, finally, at least I'm here. This is the center of power. This is the seat of decision-making. I'm finally here. And guess what happened? I hadn't even gone in when men of the police came into the apartment. And they asked me if I was Moses and I said, yes. They said, okay, you're coming with us. That was when I was like, oh, slow down. This is my first time here. The person whose office this is like a day. I was, I was, I, they, they didn't hear a thing that I had to say. They just grabbed me by the hand and they started reading to me the charges for all of what those other guys have done. In the dream. That was when I said, God, deliver me. Oh, I wasn't even thanking him just yet at that particular point in time because the dream was so real. I didn't know I was dreaming just yet. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't know I was dreaming just yet. It was so real. All I could think about was that, yes, finally, Rosemary would tell me she warned me. <laughs> All I was thinking about was that, yes, and the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. And at that particular point in time, I was so heartbroken, I felt like my stomach sank. Because I was like, man, and this guy knew they were coming. That was why he left very quickly. He left me to be the scapegoat. He knew what he was doing. And in the natural, I never thought they could do that. But guess what? They were already doing it. So when I, when I finally realized it was a dream and I woke up sweating like a Christmas goat, I knew that the Lord had delivered me. So I called a meeting. I set up a meeting in the natural. And I recapped to them their plan. And the guy was like, what is going on here? Who told you that? I said, no, it's not a matter of who told me. What I am telling you, why would you do that? He was like, well, actually, we were going to surprise you. And then the Holy Spirit said to me, the Holy Spirit said to me, ask him about your signature that was forged. So I said to me, I said, what kind of surprise is that? What about my signature that was forged? He said, we had no choice. He could not even deny it. He said, we had no choice. When he said that, I was like, ah, I see. I said, that's it. I'm no longer interested. He was like, oh, you can't back out now. I said, what do you mean? He says, oh, look at the website that we already set up. We've already done this. We've already done that. And I'm like, but what happened to carrying me along? And that was when the dream made sense that they were looking for somebody to be the scapegoat in case anything went wrong. I was the most professionally qualified person on that project. And that is the person who goes to jail. In the law, it's called duty of care. If you know that much, you should have done this much. And the rest of them will say, oh, we didn't even go to school. 
This is the professional. You understand? That's the mastermind. You see, but I was carrying all of those weight with me until I came to that uphill battle. And guess what? Very happily, I stopped hanging out with them. I would ask my wife, you want, y'all want to do anything? I remember the first time I asked, she looked at me, she didn't say anything because that was about the same time that I would say, oh, I'm going networking, I need to meet people. I need to meet people to expand my business, whatever. She didn't say a word. Joshua was like, can we go watch the trains? I'm like, absolutely, let's go and watch the trains. We drove there to the train station and we're just train watching and I could not be happier because I knew that God was saving me from trouble. But if I hadn't been in that hot situation, I would not have been willing to let go of those friends. I believe that every single one of us, we can relate to situations that we were faced with that made us happy to let go of things that we thought we needed. So God says we need to know exactly how he operates. If we have an understanding of how he made man, how he made Adam in the beginning, you will understand how he is making you today. We're so eager to come out of the ground. We're so eager to receive the life of God. We're so eager to receive the light. We're so eager to have this particular episode of our lives over with. And the Lord is saying, I'm still only on day three. But if I don't do the things of day three, if I don't call the land to appear out of the ocean, where will you stand if you come out now? The reason why God is keeping you where you're at is because he needs to make the crooked path straight. He needs to make all things beautiful before he brings you. You are the crown of his creation. He wants you to be what he shows off. And he can't show off with you if the stage is not already set. So what are the practical things that we need to do? We need to start to think about the working of God as an expression of his love. We need to start to examine everything that will go on, that goes on in our lives through the perspective of the love of God. You wake up in the morning and you get a notification that your account is overdrawn. Instead of you saying, why me? Why now? Not again. I'm frustrated. Why don't you just give yourself a break? And I'm going to explain what I mean by giving yourself a break. Do you know that many of us, we can take two hours out of our busy schedule to go to the gym? You're like, I'm not going to kill myself. This work is going to do itself. I'm going to the gym. And you go to work out. But you cannot take two hours break from worrying. Many of us cannot give God two hours of adoration. You are always wanting God to get the job done and your focus is always like, God, do it now, do it now, do it now, do it now. And you don't even allow yourself to enjoy a father who loves you so much. I mean, I can't imagine if all of what my sons, Joshua, for example, I can't imagine if all of what he says to me every time has to do with the things he wants me to do for him. After a while, when I see him coming, I'll close my eyes and pretend to be sleeping. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Because it's like, oh, here he comes again. He needs me to do something. I will pretend to be sleeping. I mean, because just imagine if you were God. Look at the last seven times that you went to God. If that was you, would you want to be available? You understand what I mean? Sometimes we need to learn to take a break from things that God has already promised that he will fix. Maybe that's the only thing we're going to talk about today because I'm looking at the time. But I want to share with you around that subject as much as I can, as quickly as I can. Because I was the one who went to the Holy Spirit and I said, I want something practical. And he showed to me that we need to learn how to take breaks breaks. God made light. He took a break. Yeah. He said, let there be light. And there was light. And we were like, oh, that's it for one day. I'm going home. That was all he did. When he made the firmament, that's, that's it. He said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, separating the waters from the waters. He is God. He could have said, hold on, hold on, Holy Spirit. I'm about to say a couple of things. Make it happen. He could have said, let there be light. And after that, the firmament. And after that, land. And after that, trees. And after that, man. And after that, I'm resting. He could have just said everything at once. But guess what? He was setting the stage so that we will have an example to follow that we can manage. 
God took a break after every day. The Bible says, so the evening and the morning were the first day. God will do things in blocks. But we, we want to fix everything at the same time. The reason why we let our finances weigh us down quite often is because we think about all of the things that we need to do that we cannot do just yet. And we think about all of the times that we have had financial trouble. Even the ones that are behind you, you call it back and say, oh, that was how it was last year. That was how it was last month. No, what is behind you is already behind you. Paul says, forgetting the things that are behind. We press forward. I take the lessons. I leave the details. You understand what I mean? But we want to bring everything to God and bring everything all at once. And God is saying in your day-to-day -day life, I want you to learn to take a break from thinking about the husband that you don't have yet. Take a break from thinking about the money that you do not have yet. Take a break from that person that makes you worry about your children. Take a break and just say, you know what? Between 9 a.m. and 9.45 a.m., I am not thinking about any one of those things. Oh, you know how your mind works? The first couple of days, it's not going to happen. By 9, 12, you're like, uh, okay, I just thought about that, Lord, I'm sorry. Okay, let me come back to, yeah. But guess what? The Bible says we have our senses sharpened by reason of use. Do not give up on this practical solution after five days. You need to keep pressing on until it works. There's nobody here that just came out of their mother's womb and got on a bicycle and rode it successfully the first time. You know how many times you fell. If we rolled up our jeans now, we'll see bruised knees from all the falling off the bike while we were learning. But now you can ride the same bike in your sleep. So you need to learn how to practice taking a break from things that weigh you down. Because some of those things, by the time you resume from the break, you realize that, wait a minute, why was I even feeling like that? That thing is not even due until tomorrow. Who knows all of the miracles that can happen between today and tomorrow? But guess what? Because you got that email, you got that text message, you got that notification, you start to panic. Do you know that some of us, some people that we have had clashes with, they text you saying, can we talk? And the moment they say, can we talk? Your heart starts beating very fast. Oh yes. You fall out with someone at church, on, 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 I mean, let's use Sunday because we don't meet on Sunday so that you know it's not here. You fall out with someone at church on Sunday and then Sunday evening, they text you saying, can we talk? And then your heart starts to beat fast. Boom, 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 boom. They haven't even, you don't even know what they want to talk about. They may call you and say, you know what? I don't want to go over any of the details. I am terribly sorry. Can we just put that behind us? But you have already worried in advance. Now, who will give you back the time that you have lost? Who would give you back the health because you, your high blood pressure went up by maybe 15 bars just because somebody texted you. We need to learn to be able to just tell ourselves, you know, I'm not going to worry about that now. They want to talk, just ask them, when? And they tell you, Tuesday night. Oh, okay, we meet Tuesday night. Let's say Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> and then between now and then, what do you do? You take a break. You allow yourself to be at peace. So when I, I asked the Lord, and there was one more thing that he showed me. And I want you to come with me to Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7. You see, because taking a break begins with taking authority over the things that have been so difficult to overcome. Because you're not going to do these things by your own flesh. You need to do it by the authority that you have in Christ Jesus. Your mind will still want to worry. Your heart will still want to take charge. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7. He says, but the Lord said to me, let's read verse 6 for some context. Verse 6 says, then I said, ha, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I am a youth. This was Jeremiah's response when God called him and told him all of the great things that he wants to do through him. And like many of us, when God tells you all of the things that he wants to do with you, you begin to think about how you are unable to make it happen. You understand what I mean? We immediately start to think about what, a lot of what things we worry about are actually things that God has promised to you, things that are good for you. 
Let's use the example again of people who are looking to have a spouse. It is the blessing of God that you will not be alone because two is better than one. And guess what now? Because it didn't happen two hours after God said it, you start to worry. You start to look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, oh, the way I look, who's going to want me? Now you are turning what God has made, what God promised to you that is supposed to be a blessing. You're turning it into a burden simply because you thought you need to make it happen. Jeremiah was here. God says, oh, I'm going to send you to the nations. I'm going to, you're going to prophesy. You will do this and that. And he was like, God, you better find somebody else because I cannot speak. But verse 7, this is what the Lord did. Verse 7, but the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth. For you shall go to all whom I send you and whatever I command you, you shall speak. I want you to say, I am not a youth. This was what the Holy Spirit gave me because I said to him, I said, there are times where we truly want to take a break. We want to be at peace. We want to, we want to be confident. We just want to give ourselves two hours of the day to say, you know what? I know that I have all of these responsibilities and all of these things that are, you know, knocking at the door, but I just want to take a break and just sit with the Lord and be in meditation and in reverence. Meditation is when you continue to remind yourself of what he has already said in his word. It is the opposite of worrying. Worrying is, worrying is reminding yourself of all of your inadequacies and all of your misfortune, quote unquote, all of the things that you think are against you. That is what worrying is. The opposite of that is meditation. You meditate on the goodness of God. You meditate on what he has said without caring how it's going to happen. You just meditate on it because your heavenly father has said so. So why aren't we able to truly take these breaks? The Lord said to me that many of us, the reason why we struggle is because we can't separate ourselves from what we have always done before we knew what we know now. You see, when you were a youth, when you were a babe in the things of God, when you were still a child, when you did not have the authority or the maturity, you had always taken the posture of running around looking for help, of worrying, of complaining, and of being afraid. And the Lord is saying, you are still thinking of yourself as you were. He told Jeremiah, you are not a youth. Jeremiah says, I'm a youth. And God says, no, you are not. And what's going on there is God is helping to change his mind. And God is helping him to realize that you are not where you were. You are where you are now because I brought you here. You don't have to be afraid. No one's going to embarrass you like they embarrassed you when you were a youth. No one's going to break your heart like they broke your heart while you didn't know what you were doing. You are no longer that person. You are stronger now. You are better now. You are more mature now. It is having that understanding that I'm no longer a youth youth that would allow for me to be able to cross my feet on the table and just think like someone with authority as I reason with my heavenly father. You are not where you were. You are not who you were. You see, because quite often many of us, we remember how we were humiliated when we were younger. And that is the reason why you don't want that to happen to you again. And that is the reason why you don't want to take a break. All of that pressure that you put on yourself. And you're getting healed tonight and whatever is happening with that leg, we're speeding it up tonight. Praise the Lord. God is good. And so here is the deal, y'all. The Lord is calling us today to remembrance. L don't forget the first part of the message, which was let us stay faithful with God who is faithful. Let us just allow everything that he says to be enough for us. Let me tell you something. Let God be enough for you. You see, Anita, if God is working on your case and is bringing you those opportunities, he, already, he has a commitment to you. You understand what I mean? And so what do you do? In the meantime, you start to prepare yourself as someone waiting to receive what God is bringing as opposed to exercising and overworking yourself as the one who will bring it. What do we do? We do exactly that. We do what we can, confident that God will do what he says. And by so doing, we remain in faithfulness to God rather than trying to go find help where there is no help. So, to the actual message of today, a practical step to having peace while you wait. 
we know that many of us are still in our waiting season. And we just can't find that peace because we can't take that break because we want to see everything happen at once. God does things in blocks. He does things in steps, line upon line, precept upon precept. And if his steps are not happening as quick as you want it to happen, you are the one who needs to slow down. Don't get ahead of God. He is faithful. Don't let anything put you under pressure to the point wherein you are not putting God under pressure. When things are putting you under pressure, what do you do? Take a break. Just step back and say, you know what? The reason why I am feeling the pressure is because I'm afraid of this, I'm afraid of that, I'm afraid of this other one. But where did all that fear come from? My yesterday. But I am no longer that 17 year old. I am no longer that 27 year old. I am no longer that 42 year old. It is no longer me, it is the new me. And this new me can handle it because God will not give me more than I can handle. And so let us separate ourselves from the fears of yesterday because it is today. I'm going to show you one more scripture and with this one we're going to break bread still in the book of Jeremiah. And because Jeremiah is us and we are Jeremiah. So Jeremiah verse 1, I mean chapter 1, but this time around verse 19. After the Holy Spirit showed me that we are no longer who we, who we, who we were when we, res, when we sustained the trauma. He said to me, your brothers and sisters in the natural have two legs and they take one step after another. If they are going to make progress, they need another leg to stand on. And then he brought me to Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 19 and look at what it says. It says, they will fight against you but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. Ah, praise the Lord. You see, the Lord says, I am with you to deliver you. So that means that same God knows all of the odds that are against you. You know, many of us, we typically feel the need to go and explain to God all of our problems. You describe to God the bigness of your problem instead of reminding yourself the greatness of your God. And this same God is saying, I know they will come against you. In fact, he's telling Jeremiah that the ones you have seen, that, that, that's not all. There is more coming. God already knows and that is the reason why he positioned himself in your life for one purpose and that is to deliver you. That degree of commitment, you need to believe it. You need to know it. You see many of us, if we spend our energies and our time and our passion and our mental abilities in believing God, we will not have any energies left to doubt him. So what do you do? Just believe that he is with you. It doesn't matter who's knocking on the door. It doesn't matter if they've sent you a quick notice. It doesn't matter what pressure. People are designed and life is made to do all of that to you, to bring out the best in you. So don't see it as opposition. These trials have come to make you and I strong even when we don't see how they will. But the way to overcome the, temporal, the, the temporary setback of worry, of doubt, of frustration. The way to overcome those is to recognize that no one can do a thing to you that God cannot deliver you from. You can never find yourself in a situation that God cannot deliver you from. He said it. It's either you believe it or you don't. And what do I recommend? What does God want? God's word recommend? God's word recommends that you believe that he is able. He says, I am here to deliver you. And so if God is the one to deliver me, then why am I trying to deliver me? <laughs> you 
Let me tell you something. Let me give an advice to people who are very driven. You know, we have different drives. Some of us are more driven than others. Okay? There are some people, if they're not running for businesses at the same time, they will feel like they're not feeling well. Yeah, well, you give yourself up, John, because he laughed out loud. You know, they have to be doing several things at the same time. Yeah. You see, but there are people who are okay with just going to that one job and they're fine. There are some people who are okay just with certain level of enterprise. So this message, what I'm about to say, is specifically for those of us who are very driven. If you are very driven, one thing about you is that you always want to be the one driving. You, you, you don't, if things are not moving fast enough, you get frustrated. You want to move things. You want to move things. And that is your nature that was given to you by God. So rather than letting that drive drive you crazy, find other things to keep you busy. Oh, let me say that again. Find other things to keep you busy. Find things that empower you as opposed to things that deplete you. Because driven people are always looking for something to do, where to put their intellect, where to put their ideas, where to put their energy. And when it comes to waiting on what God, when, when it comes to seeing the unveiling of what God has for you, that doesn't usually help. If anything at all, it hurts. An example of that is Peter. Peter was always getting into trouble because he was such a driven person. Anytime Jesus had an idea, Peter was like, I got this. I'm running with this. But sometimes God did not need him to run, but he would jump in the water. God does not need him to do anything. He draws his sword. He creates more problems sometimes. You understand what I mean? He's always doing stuff. One day Jesus looked at him before Jesus was taken up in the heavens. You know what Jesus said to him? Jesus looked at him and he said to him, he says, Peter, do you know with all of your exuberance and your energy, your zeal, Jesus says, can you believe that a day will come when you, Peter, will not be able to go from A to B on your own without somebody helping you. Peter was like, me? Oh, Jesus, I got energy. Jesus says, one day, a child would have to take you by the hand to go use the bathroom. Peter struggled with that idea. And I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, why did Jesus tell that to Peter, knowing that was the last thing Peter wanted to hear? And the Holy Spirit said to me that he needed something to work with. If Jesus did not give him that picture, he would work himself to the ground. Jesus told him that so that he can know that, you know what, there's, there's help for a reason. I'm not always going to be the one to do it. So if I can't do it, let me just wait for somebody to help. Because Peter always just wanted to do it on his own. So what do you do when you are that person? Let me give you an example of one of the things that I have learned to do in my seasons of hyperactivity. When I get really restless, like I want to do something. I would tell myself, this is what I want to do. I want to set up this practice. I want to set this thing up. And I'm so eager. But first of all, I will go and find in scripture where it was done. Let me say that again. That's just an example of one of the things that I've learned to do. So before jumping out to register that company or to look for someone who's going to partner with me, sometimes I'll be like, let me go and find it first of all in scripture. And you know what's going to happen? In the process of finding it in scripture and putting all my energy into searching scriptures and doing all of that, and I come to a place of, of exhaustion, a holy exhaustion, if you would, when I have depleted all of that exuberance within me and I'm like, you know what? It's not going to work because this is it in scripture. What I'm thinking of doing is not going to happen. So what do I do? Let me modify my plans. By that time, somebody else needs me to do something. And so if we do not find things to do that are constructive and things that replenish us, we will keep struggling when it comes to being able to rest. Every one of us, we need to learn how to rest. You need activities that replenish you, not take away from you. Because God wants you in this season to learn to do those three things that I have just mentioned. You need to learn how to recognize that the past is the past and you're no longer there, that where you're at right now, you're not alone, that God is your help, and to also recognize that if God is your help, then I need a particular measure of rest, because even God will rest after having accomplished. And so I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, particularly as we receive of the Lord's body and drink of his blood, in remembrance of him, 
that we will allow ourselves to grow. That we would allow ourselves to be nourished by the love of God. That we would allow ourselves to be at peace, knowing fully well that Jesus went through all of that so that we can have peace. The Bible says that the chastisement of our peace was placed upon him. I want you to start to address issues of your own. I want you to speak to yourself. You know the area of restlessness. You know how it's been difficult for you to rest and trust God in certain areas. Go to those places right now in prayer. Before we eat, before we drink, I want you to go to those places and just bring out the issues. And say, Lord, this is it. And I lay it before you not to take it back, but to leave it here at the altar. The reason why I always want to respond this way, the agitation, I lay it down at the altar. I don't want to keep spearheading it by myself. I want you to lead so that I can follow. I'm no longer going to be afraid of challenging situations because I know that they have come to give me wisdom to help me to lighten the load, to give me such an advantage so that by the time I'm coming down into the valley, I gain speed that I could not have gained if I haven't gone through the difficult situation. Lord, help me to be thankful. Help me to have appreciation. Help me to develop new habits so that I'm not left empty. As I am putting out the old, let me receive the new. As I am repenting from the old, let me be replenished by the new. Father, I need this transition to happen. And because it's a need and you are the one who meets my needs, that means it's already a guarantee that this transition is prepared by you and it will happen. If I were you at this time, I'm actually going to ask God in a plea and say, Lord, boost my confidence in you. Like the apostle said, Lord, increase our faith. Ask God to boost your confidence in him. He has given to each and every one of us a measure of faith and say, Lord, let there be a multiplication of that measure within me. In the mighty name of Jesus, I want us all to say this prayer. I'm just going to call out a couple of pointers and then I want you to pray on your own. And this is about all of what needs to happen before you happen. God is making the light, is making the space, is making the land, is making the trees, is making the fruits, is making the animals, is making all of those things because of you, even though you don't see it. By faith, begin to thank God for all of what he's doing that you cannot see. Father, I thank you for all the things that you are putting in place that I would need that I do not even know that I need. Thank you for that future spouse that you're currently working on, even as you're working on me. Thank you, Father, for that client that I'm going to be serving soon and how you're preparing for them to be able to afford me, how you're preparing for them to enjoy my services, how you're preparing for them to be able to appreciate what I am bringing to the table. That is, that, that, those are the things that you are putting in place and it's okay because I trust you. Some of us at this particular point in time, we need to thank God for our children. You need to thank God for, for they're showing you a lot of willpower right now. But thank God for, the, for what he's building and developing on the inside of them. The resilience that they are building in that process. Thank God for it. You don't yet see all of the reasons why they are the way they are. But thank God because God gave them to you for signs and for wonders. And we just need to believe that for us to be able to partner with God correctly. Make it a prayer of thanksgiving. And as we break bread tonight, I'm just going to quickly share one more thing with us as we break bread. But let's wrap this prayer up with this one more thing. You know, the Bible says that broad is the way that leads to destruction. But narrow and difficult is the way that leads to life. 
a lot of what we do in our relationship with God is borrowed from the world because that's what everybody is doing. So this one more prayer before we break bread is this. Speak to your heart and say, heart, you will not be conformed to the world, but you will be transformed through the process of renewal. I let go of traditions that have not helped me. I let go of mindsets that are contrary to the word of God. I let go of strategies that overwork me, that overwhelm me rather than help me. I let go of those things. I put up my blockers against the tirades of recommendations of ideas from the world that are not designed for someone who trusts in God, that are not designed for someone whose God is the helper, that are not designed for someone who has a deliverer already. I put my blockers up. Those ideas will not get to me. Those recommendations will not get to me. But I am going to stand upon the word of God. I'm going to be confident in the God of my salvation. In the mighty name of Jesus. So very quickly, I want a couple of people to come up here before we break bread. And I'm just going to mention the three categories that I see. If you are in any one of those categories, I want you to come up. The first category is you have seen the cloud that is supposed to bring you rain again and again, but there's no rain. You keep seeing it, it's like, man, so finally this is going to happen and it doesn't happen. You've seen it multiple times, it's like, but these are all the parameters. Everything that they told me would happen has already been, I've seen it, but there is no blessing. There is no rain. Everyone who has seen a cloud that is supposed to be rain bearing who hasn't yet received the water, I want you to come up here. I want to pray with you. The next category of people that I see is... You look at the blood of Jesus every time and you think to yourself, why am I still struggling with this? Was it not said that the blood of Jesus washes away my sins? Why am I still struggling with this? You look at the divine ability of God, but yet you're looking at something within you that your willpower has not been able to overcome. I want you to come up here. If that has been your thoughts, if that has been in your thoughts of late, it generally applies to all of us, but if of late, say in the last one or two days, you've been thinking about it, or in the last couple of days, saying, if the blood already takes care of things like this, why am I struggling? If you are in that category, I want you to come up, I want to pray with you. The last category that I see is this. I see an ax that is in a piece of wood. It's in a block of wood. And you're trying to remove the axe because you need to use the axe, but you can't even pick it up. And I want you to listen to this very carefully because of how specific it is. You have identified exactly what you need to do to get out of where you're at. I need to acquire this skill. I need to take this exam. I need to take this test so that I can use it to cut down all these other trees, but I can't even pick it up. I can't even get this ax to come out of the block of wood that is in. And you're feeling frustrated because you have been told that you need the ax to cut the trees, but you can't even pick up the ax. And you're like, God, what am I going to do? I need to, I need to be able to take this ax. So you're not even talking about the blessing itself. You're talking about what the process is that leads to the blessing and you don't even know how to function in it. If you are in that category, I want you to come forth. For someone in particular who needs to be here, it's prayer. You know you need prayer, but you can't pick prayer up. Your prayer life has become dull and you're like, but I'm trying to pick it up because I know in my thinking, I recite prayers that address this situation and that situation, but I'm just not doing it. There is no shame in needing help for a season so that you can have testimonies in the next season. If that is you, you can't pick up the ax, come forward. I want to pray for you. So Father, I'm in the matter name of Jesus. So today I'm not praying with you, I am praying for you. So you don't even have to pray along. I just want you to open your heart to believe. So begin to practice and exercise taking a break, okay? So take a break. Take a break from saying, oh, I'm going to pray. No, you're here to be prayed for because the Lord is your help 
and he has brought that help in the form of the unction, the prophetic unction today to see the chains broken. One day we're going to have a Wednesday meeting. I want you to have it on your calendar or just mental calendar. There is a Wednesday meeting that we're about to have and it's going to be a Wednesday meeting of the prophetic. Okay? It's going to be a Wednesday meeting of the prophetic because I can see it. It's a Wednesday and everyone is getting prophesied over. And I'm talking about prophecies that are very specific, very tangible and transformational. So I have that mental calendar. And I'm sure, it may, it, it, I'm, I'm sure, not it may, I'm sure it has something to do with you. Because as soon as I got here, that was the conversation that was going on, that it's Wednesday and it's time for prophecy. So I want you to come close. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for this woman. As she's come forth today, having seen the cloud, she will receive the showers. It is your time and season for the shower. In the mighty name of Jesus, let it rain. Let it rain. In the mighty name of Jesus, I want you to say something. You're not praying the way you pray. You're just making a declaration. And I want you to look up to heaven, visualize that cloud, and say, let it rain. Can you see the rain? Say it again until you see the rain. Let it rain. Let it rain. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, it will rain. It will rain. You see, I stand in agreement with you today and you stand as a witness with me because you and I both, we need that rain. And it is coming. It is a season for our rain. And we're about to congratulate each other because finally we have that rain. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. Anybody else who came for the cloud without the rain? Okay, Michelle and Manolita too. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because it is time for my sister's rain. That rain of blessing. The delay is over. The Lord said to us, praise the Lord, hallelujah, in the mighty name of Jesus on Tuesday that the storm is over. The storm is over, now let the rain begin. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the calm, but we also need the rain. In the mighty name of Jesus, there is somebody else who needs to be here. And I, I'm just going to give you a quick opportunity real quick. You know you need God's help, but you think you're okay asking for that help where you're at. <laughs> you see, there's a reason why God raises people into different offices so that he can serve their brothers and sisters with special abilities by God. God raises prophets for a reason. He says, if you would believe my prophets, you will be established. God hears you when you pray, but then he also wants somebody to declare as an oracle in his name, your breakthrough. So I'm going to just give you about 20 seconds to come here. When you come here, tell me you are the one because I have a word for you. You know you're struggling. You know you need God, but you still, for some reason, just want to do it your way. And God says, no, the solution is right here. I have already solved it, and I have put the word in the mouth of my anointed one to speak it over you. One day, it will be you speaking over somebody else, but today, it is you who needs to come forward. Father, I'm in the name of Jesus. Did you come for the cloud? Father in Jesus' name, it will come. He that will come will come and will not tarry, says the Lord. Let it rain over Josephine. Let it rain over her. Let it rain. The rain that will bring the cleansing. The rain that will bring refreshing. Let it rain. Even the rain that will soften the ground. Let it rain in the mighty name of Jesus. The 20 seconds is about to be over. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for a new lease of life over this woman in the mighty name of Jesus. A new lease of life over this woman in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, let there be whatever it is that is getting in the way, I break you open right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Yes, so let every 
do that has come for deliverance today, let it come, let it come, let it come, and let it rest mightily upon the ones who need it, upon the thirsty soul, upon the parched ground. Let the do come, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Let it come upon the tender herbs. Let it come in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for this new thing that you are doing. Thank you for this new lease of life. Thank you for this new chapter. Thank you for the sparkle of light. Thank you for the fragrance of joy. Thank you, Lord, for the many I keep seeing sparks of light. Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, thank you for this new thing. So where is Michelle? Is Michelle still here? Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. Lord, I thank you because it's time for you to have more to show for the things that you have said. You have made declarations because of your confidence in God and you are about to have more things to show for it. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, she will have things to show for it in the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. Alrighty, Anita, you came out for the cloud or you came out for the blood? It's yours, Michelle. It is yours. It is your and it's gonna come, not just one. I see three of them. It's gonna come one after the other. They're gonna come. They will come. In fact, what I'm seeing is that the first load will still be on the property even when the third one comes. So they, they're going to come in quick successions like that. And then you will call them and say, this is what I've been saying. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our sight. It's happening very quickly. Very, very quickly. Even in a matter of days. In the matter name of Jesus. Lord in Jesus name. Okay, okay, wait a minute. There is somebody here. The cry of your heart is you truly want to genuinely love the things of God. I hear someone says, Lord, I want to love you and I want to love the things that you expect of me. I want to love being in your presence. I want to, you, you've tried, but it's just like you don't feel the passion and you're saying, I hear the cry of your heart. If that is you, you want, who's that? Oh Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. I want you to come around, just come around this way. Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you. You can stay there. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. The word of the Lord to you is that word from Proverbs that came forth earlier. The wife of your youth. Live joyfully with the wife of your youth. Let her satisfy you always. The wife of your youth is your first love. That passion that you once had for the things of God. That excitement and enthusiasm for anything that involves you and God, whether it is studying the word of God on your own or teaching someone scripture, whether it is praying or witnessing, anything that you do in partnership with God, the way it once excited you, it will excite you again. The Lord is healing your backsliding. The Lord is healing your heart. The Lord is curing the disappointment. The Lord is invigorating you once again and imbuing you with life in the mighty name of Jesus. You see, I see shields over certain people that is keeping you from receiving the dew. There is dew in this place. And so I want you to renounce anything that may be in the way of love. Just renounce unforgiveness. Renounce doubt. Renounce worry. With your own mouth say that I refuse to doubt. I refuse to worry. I believe God wholeheartedly. I receive joyfully what God has for me. Say that and just let that shield, whatever it is, let it get away from you so that you can receive your blessing. Somebody else is receiving. You see, there is somebody here. There's something wrong with you in your health. You haven't told us, but God has told me. And he wants you to receive your healing. Don't say, well, oh, I wish I had asked for prayers. Maybe I shouldn't have kept it to myself. It's okay. God knows all of your reasons why. And they say, you may not have told them, but come forward, be prayed for, and then you will tell them your testimony when it is done. So if that is you, there is an ailment in your body, but you haven't told us. You haven't asked for prayers, but you know that things ain't right. So I want you to come forward. I want to pray for you right now. If that is you, just come forward. I want to pray for you right now. You haven't told us. You're like, eh, maybe it's not even a serious thing, but I know that I feel that discomfort. I want you to come forward. Come of your own volition. Come of your own accord. The Lord has healing for you in the mighty name of Jesus. You see, when the Lord says he knows all of the reasons why you haven't really told anyone or asked for prayers, it's because he really understands. But then himself was planning your deliverance. He says, I am with you to deliver you. You understand what I mean? It's not going to get any bigger 
than it has been. It's not going to get any worse. It's not going to be more any inconvenient because the Lord nips it in the bud right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you because you have made her whole. I want, you see, I want you to step forward a little bit because what the Lord wants you to experience in this place today is complete deliverance. And you would feel the power of God come over you before you leave here today. You don't have to imagine it. You don't have to, you know, kind of like feel the power without feeling the power. I am telling you what the promise of God is. You will feel the power of God run through your body. Can somebody get me the oil of the anointing? I'm going to anoint you with oil today and your testimony is one of the next ones. Your testimony is one of the next ones. You know, I saw this particular moment and I had totally forgotten about it. I wasn't, I saw it, but I didn't think about it while I was teaching because I just wanted us to understand those principles for taking a break, for breaking free from worry, for, from worrying that I forgot this moment. But I saw this moment of people coming in for deliverance, people coming in and coming forth for healing. And so I'm just so thankful to God because the faithfulness of God will not even allow us to go home today without receiving the fullness of what he has for us. You see, before the oil gets here, I, I saw you in the spirit and you were reading a new book. You see what I mean? You were reading a new book. You see, this, is not, this might not be a physical book. There might be a physical book. But what I am saying is your heart, your subconscious mind has chosen to read a new book. It's going to be effortless. Whenever you find yourself struggling, remind yourself that the word of God says it will be effortless. Any struggle is a residue from the past and you are not there. So just walk away from the struggle and receive what the grace of God is doing in your life. You see, a boldness is coming over you that would allow for you to be comfortable to let people know that you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see this boldness that is coming upon you. I see you declaring to people your age, declaring to people your age that, no, no, I don't worry about things like that because Jesus got me covered. And you spoke without looking at their faces because you're not looking for their validation. You are speaking because of your conviction. In the mighty name of Jesus, speak, O daughter of Zion, speak. Prophesy, O daughter of Zion, prophesy. It is your time to stand by the Lord because the Lord is standing by you in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for the oil of the anointing. I thank you because it's enough. Anointing them with oil is what the word of the Lord says. Where is Jordan? I want you to come and stand here. You see, because you have a part to play in this story. And the part you have to play in this story is also that you will be a tribute to the testimony of this woman's deliverance. Oh yes, Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. I want you to stand behind her because it's a miracle that is not just for her, but it is for you too. In her life, it has already become a need. In yours, it isn't, but the Lord wants to fix it before it becomes a need. So Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, this is it. In the mighty name of Jesus, let the power from on high that has been brought in here today through the portal of God's mercy, let it rest mightily upon this woman. I declare you whole in the mighty name of Jesus. Once it is fixed in you, it is fixed in her because the Lord has done a forever thing for you. The Bible says, whatsoever the Lord does stands forever. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you for the privilege that we have of anticipating this woman's testimony of deliverance. In Jesus' name, praise the Lord. God is good. Alrighty. So let's, let's make it quick. If you haven't been prayed for, I want you to come close. Alrighty. And if you've been prayed for, I like what you're doing, Josephine. If you've been prayed for and you want to go ahead and just break bread, break bread. Lord, in Jesus' name. Okay, so I prayed for you already, but I'm going to pray for you again. That that which the Lord, you see, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I want you to receive the wisdom here today because it is available to call out situations in your life that are mere illusions. So that when they come as thoughts, as people's behaviors, you will say, no, that's an illusion. 
I am royalty, I am not to be disrespected. I am royalty, I'm a royal priesthood, I will not be dishonored. I will not be disregarded. And so if anybody dishonors you, it's an illusion, it's not meant for you. You put it at bay in the mighty name of Jesus. You receive, this is divine wisdom. God is giving you wisdom right now. It's been injected into you. The wind of the Holy Spirit has been injected into you to stir up the gifts that are there. For you to be able to say, you know what, that is not me. I'm not even going to pay attention because I am royalty. I'm not going to be treated that way. And so you put all of those things at bay. The devil wants to keep pulling you back to where you were and you have to stand your ground and declare the word of God exposing the darkness. Expose the darkness. Expose the illusion and enjoy the brightness of the glory of God around you in your life. Kenyatta, let me pray for you. You see, where you're at right now is not where you're going. Okay, it's a temporary stop. I can't, I mean, I can imagine being at a bus stop that has LED screens that can keep you entertained and keep you occupied. But the Lord is saying, tell your heart not to put down roots where you're at for a venture. I'm talking about the venture, your, your business, what you're doing right now, okay? Tell your heart not to put roots there. It's dangerous to put down roots in the wilderness because you're not to be planted there, okay? So enjoy it, give it your best, but don't give it your roots. You understand what I mean? Pour out your gift, use your talent, use your experience, use your skills, but keep telling yourself that this is not the place where I take root. God has another place for you and it's around the corner. It is around the corner. It is on the 17th street. It is on the street of victory. You understand what I mean? So just because, let me tell you something. I'll just spell it out to you. The, what the Lord is revealing to me is that you need to be intentional about what God has for you. Because if you put down roots where you're at, you become reluctant to move when the time comes. Every reluctance that may want to occupy you and keep you from running with, with, with zest into your promised land to possess your possession. I rebuke that spirit now in the mighty name of Jesus. You will not be hesitant, but you will be willing. For the word of the Lord says, if you be willing and obedient, you will eat the fruit of the land. Father, I give you praise in Jesus' name. Alexis, let me pray for you. Oh, yes. So in the mighty name of Jesus, let me pray for Alexis, and I'm going to pray for you in a minute. You have to be, you have to take authority in humility. And what that means is you first of all come and humble yourself under the mighty end of God. Open yourself to him and say to him, if there be any wicked ways in me, examine my heart and be willing to let go of whatever it is that the Lord points out. And you see, as you come under his authority, you then will be able to say to this one, go and it will go, come and it will come. And to the servant that is in your house, you'll be able to say, do this and it will do it. And so I say to you in that order, come under the authority of God in humility. Let him take away from you the things that should not be. Don't hold on to anything. Don't resist anything. Even if it has to do with your style, not just your lifestyle, but even your style. There are certain things that you've always wanted to put on and you like putting it on. When the Lord comes and says, that needs to go, don't, don't struggle. This is you coming under his authority. Let him take from you what he hasn't put on you. Let him take it, remove it, and that is what is going to activate in fullness your authority. The battles you're fighting are not power battles, they are authority battles. And you need to be able to say to this one, go, and it will go. Come, and it will come. Do, and it will be done. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, every stronghold, I stand in here today, in the authority of one that has been sent. I am sent here, I am sent to you for the cry of your soul has been heard. And so every oppressor of your life, every delusion, every misinterpretation that has found its way into your thought place, into your heart, into your thinking, into your paradigms. I stand against them today by the blood of the Lamb. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I declare your freedom today. 
So hear me and hear me good. All of the ones who have arrayed themselves against this woman, even the ones who have thought in the realm of the spirit that they know how to have their way with her thoughts and actions, it is over. Today, this woman is delivered from every manipulation in the mighty name of Jesus. I am not here to hear any legal claims to this woman. I am here to declare her deliverance. So be quiet and leave. In the mighty name of Jesus, let every wind that is not of God come out in the mighty name of Jesus and make room for the holy wind of God. Now, in the mighty name of Jesus, longevity is not legality. I forbid you. Let this woman go. Amen. Let her go that she must serve Amen. the Lord. With all of what her heavenly father has given to her, so let her go. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to just lay your hand on your friend there, if you don't mind, Isabella, and just agree with her. Yes, and just lay your hand on her and just agree with her that her joy will be full. Uh, that I juggle before every thought that has been placed before God, as random as they may seem, he can hear every single one of them. And he says, your joy will be full. So just agree with her and just agree with her in celebration because her joy will be full. You see, that which takes other people six months will be waived for you simply because the Lord is eager to bring you to your fullness. Let me tell you something, requirements will be waived for you just so that you are not kept out any longer from where God has called you to play and to prosper in the mighty name of Jesus. When that time comes, you will hear these words in your heart and you will say, Father, I thank you because this is what you said. This is being waived. They will ask you, you can do it if you want to, but if you don't want to, you don't have to. Tell them, I'm not. It's been waived. And you will say, the Lord, quicken your step unto righteousness in the mighty name of Jesus and unto establishment in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for Scott. Scott is here because he wants his passion for the things of God to be real, to be genuine. You want to have joy when you're talking about the things of God, when you're studying his word, when you're praying. You don't want to be reminded to do it. You want you want to do it, you, you, you want to have that passion that will make you say, I can't wait to do this. I, I really want to go in and be with God. Let me tell you something, young man. It is a journey that is most rewarding. This journey with God. You see, when you give him time, it gives you eternity. Amen. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you for this great privilege of having to see great grace being bestowed upon this woman. In the mighty name of Jesus. Where is Alexis? Sorry. You see, as I was praying for you, I saw something upon her. But the grace of God that brings a multiplication of attention, of focus, of divine consciousness be upon you, Scott, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. What I said when I said this woman is this. What I saw when I said this woman is this. You see, the Lord is your defense. Let that sink in. He will fight your battles. He said, do nothing. I am here for your deliverance. So every one of those mindsets and every one of those, you've, you have determined within you that certain things are a must. You have to do it because if you don't, no one will. The Lord is saying, I will. Breathe, relax, let go, and watch him fight for you. Watch him fend for you. Watch him move on your behalf. You see, the thing is, let me tell you this. I saw a little version of you, more like a 12-year-old girl, and someone commended you for how responsible you were. And you believed it. You took it on that, oh, if, if I always do things, people would commend me for being responsible. I took responsibility for, the responsibility for this, responsibility for that. God bless you. But now God is saying, I want you to see how I, your heavenly father, how I am responsible for you. You're not just going to relax and no longer be responsible for things, but now you will know your place and allow God to take his place 
it's not every one of those things that your diligence can fix. Some of those things are only going to be fixed by your trust in Him. In the mighty name of Jesus. Can I pray with you about the hammer? You see that hammer that I saw? You're one of those people you need to be able to get a grip on that hammer. The hammer or the axe is stuck in the block of wood. You need to be able to retrieve that axe to be able to fell the other trees. And God has given you authority to be able to pull that axe. And he just wants you to come here today. To stand in here as one who believes in the process of divine intervention. So let me just pray with you if you would come even closer. And I just want you to say, Lord, thank you. Because you have me covered. I can trust you totally. And now I want you to just plead with him and say, Lord, help me. I'm asking, help me. Sometimes God just wants us to ask because he's already promised that if we ask, we will receive. As you have asked for his help today, you will see his hand move. That which has been taken from you will be given back to you and more. In the mighty name of Jesus, God will give you an opportunity to bring out your very best. No one's seen you yet at your best. Those hidden abilities, it is time, it is the season to step upon the podium that would allow for you to bring out more. You got more. And it's time for that more to be brought out so that you can be more. Not so that you can now be confident in yourself, but so that you can appreciate even more the love of your heavenly father. Take hold of that ax. That ax refers to skill. It refers to wisdom. It represents the ability to be able to go to the next level. It represents requirements that have been met that just need to be presented for your honor, for your access, and for your opportunities to be fully harnessed. So take the ax. The Lord your God has given you authority today. So if there's anything that you turned your back on saying, you know what, I don't want to do that. It's too much work. No, the Lord is saying, just go for it. I have made it easy because you need to show them what is in your hand. And then you will see what has always been in your heart delivered to you. It is your season in the mighty name of Jesus to be of help. It is your season to be helped. Father, thank you for this moment. You see, there's a shift. Let it happen. Let your heart go there. Let it go there. The Lord is the one moving your heart. He's the one tugging on your heart. Let your heart go there. Let it go to that place that the Lord is leading. Because what I'm seeing are thoughts saying, uh, but if I do this, uh, isn't that going to mean that? Let your heart go there. Because it's not going to be you, it is the Lord. The Lord says, I am here to deliver you. That word about Jeremiah is especially for you also today. God bless you in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. Um, I want you to pray for Scott when you get home. I want you to pray for him. You already know certain things that you need to declare over him. So don't wait till tomorrow. When you get home, just declare it over him. It's still fresh. Declare it because once he has that picture, he will run with it. You see what I mean? So he doesn't want to open that thing again. No, he wants to close everything and run with it. So speak it tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for Hannah. Thank you for this new phase in her life. I thank you, Father, for the wisdom. Just say to yourself, Lord, I receive the wisdom to operate in this new version of me. I receive the wisdom to function and to not just impress, but to make an impression. You know, you're not just doing things to impress anybody. The Bible says doing all things as unto the Lord and not unto man. You will make an impression that is indelible. An impression that will make another commit to you more than they have ever committed to anybody. They will commit to you because they will see that every seed they sow into you will bring forth a harvest that will glorify your heavenly father. But you will make that impression because your heart is right. And so just continue steadfastly in doing what the Lord has already shown you to do. You will operate by his wisdom in this new space that you find yourself in the mighty name of Jesus. And the Lord will allow for you to be an advisor. You will give advice that is timely. You will give advice that is easy to digest. You will come alongside as a pillar of support. And also, you will come alongside as an added 
fluidity to her wheel. I see a wheel that needs to turn more smoothly and the Lord would allow you to be that lubricant to make it happen so that she would do with ease in this season that which she has just received as a new opportunity. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. God is good. Father, thank you for this woman. You see the things that the Lord was revealing to you that are falling off, that are not coming back on. Don't pick them back up. Just let go. Completely trust the Lord for your affection to be for him and to be guided by him in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you because no vomit will be picked up. Everything that was once held on to that you have said to let go of that has been released, every care, every concern, every affection that you have said to release will not be picked up again because the Lord is filling you now with new ones, with the ones that have always been required. A new affection, I hear the Lord say, I give to you this day in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is good. Alrighty. And, and are you walking in your healing? Okay, let me lay my hands on you and, and, and anoint you with oil and we're going to be out of here in the next couple of minutes because we still haven't broken bread, some of us, but I want to pray for Anne. Thank you. When you finally get here, I want to lay my hands on you. Oh yeah. So that is the word of the Lord to you today that it will be expedited. Alrighty. So which one is it? Oh yeah, yeah. I had surgery yesterday. Oh yeah, I know men have walked, I've, I've worked on it. And now we're about to see Hallelujah. what the Lord has done with it. Yes. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we accelerate the healing yes, of this woman's leg. Every part of her body that is connected to the full restoration of this knee and of her entire body, let it flow freely. Amen. Let your healing flow freely into every part of her body that is connected with this restoration in the mighty name of Jesus. You see what I see is I see like a little machine being wound almost as if it's being cranked up. And I know that whatever they say is not what you will experience. You will experience a much quicker recovery, a full recovery. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because this woman will see your salvation. There is something else that I am seeing. Ah, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. You see, I see you peeking through a bush. You're peeking because there's something that you want to see. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, lift her up and give her a new vantage position to be able to see all of that which is ahead. You know, those thoughts of if I can just see, if I can just know the Lord has heard, you will see, you will know what is ahead. So you can posture your heart and position right for what God has for you. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because I release over you today a dream that will explain it. A dream that will make it clear. Be made whole in Jesus' name. Amen. Sister Barbara, have I prayed for you? What have you, I prayed for you already? No, what did you come for? I came for you to pray for my, my family. Okay. All right, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let there be light. Whatever darkness that is lurking in the hearts, in relationships, as far as my sister Barbara's family is concerned, let them be shattered, shattered completely by the light of your love. You know what you've done today? you have brought God's attention and heaven's intervention into those situations. And I want you to begin to practice how you would testify of God's deliverance over the ones that you love in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Kanita, we will take your testimony on Tuesday. We will take it. Say that again. Oh yeah, God is good. Brother Bannard. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this man. What if I told you that the Lord has heard you what if I told you that the Lord has done it? What if I told you that soon you will see it? Would that be enough? <laughs> Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, godliness with contentment is great gain 
you are about to gain very greatly because what you uttered, you uttered by faith, confident in God that it will be enough. <laughs> the Lord is enough for you. The Lord is enough for you. Because you have the one that is being enough, you will have more than enough. What if I told you she will be made whole? What if I told you I'm restoring her joy? What if I told you that she will be a great example to the little ones? Will that be enough? Jesus. This man came in here today with such a hunger. I could feel the draw and I thank God that we get to witness these declarations of the love of God over you. Because faithful is he who has promised who will also do it. Let us go ahead and break bread. Thank you, Jesus. Oh yeah. Say that again. Oh, you have what you need. Praise, God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Hallelujah. Okay, now so let me let me let me say this. You see, I saw that you already have what you need, but then at the same time, I saw that. You, 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 you pressed in when you could have stayed out. And this is what was handed to you in the vision that I saw just briefly as I was opening my cup. I see you receiving a vessel like a bucket. It's like a trough, but it's got a handle. And what is being said as you were given, is that this is what you need to retain what you will receive. So you are about to experience some blessings that you have had before. You are about to receive blessings that you've seen similar blessings before, but you were not able to retain them. They were just coming and going, coming and going. The Lord has given you a vessel now with which to retain. You will accumulate even for the next season from this one. You see, and I'm, and I'm told that I, needed to, that I need to tell you this, that that is what you get for pressing in. That is what you get for pressing in. Because I told you, you have what you need, but your heart's still pressed in. Like, okay, I could be walking away, but I'm still going to press in. So that's what you get for pressing in. You see, the reward of diligently seeking is that you find God's face. Is your season to retain, my friend. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for your patience tonight. And I know that every single one of us being here today, hearing the word of God, receiving it by faith into our hearts, will have testimonies to show for it in the days to come. In the mighty name of Jesus. And the Lord said to me that it will continue. And if you're wondering what it is, it's not this service. So don't be afraid. What will continue is the miracle of healing. Oh yes, the miracle of healing will continue. A couple of days ago, the Lord said to me, and he just reminded me of it now, a time is coming wherein we will bring people here to be healed. Praise the Lord. And a time is coming shortly afterwards that we will bring people here to testify. The reason why it's going to be in that order is God wants you to bring people here because some of us need to see the healing power of God in operation for us to know how much power God has given to us because he loves us. And then you will start bringing people here that you've already prayed for at Publix. People that came to borrow a pen from your desk and came back saying that they felt different after they took your pen. We will have those experiences in here. Father, we receive this bread as the body of the Lord Jesus. We receive the wine as his blood in remembrance of him. We eat unto wholeness. We eat unto love. We eat unto mercy in the mighty name of Jesus. You may eat and drink in Jesus' name name. Amen. Mm. Praise the Lord. Come on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He came in. Praise the Lord. 
All right. I, I thank God for that because we are bringing people here to meet the Lord, to be healed and to be delivered in the mighty name of Jesus. Let me tell you something that my wife reminded me of. My wife reminded me of the fact that on Tuesday, I might, or Tuesday or Saturday, that I said we are coming into a season of aggressive witnessing. Right? When she said it to me, I was like, how come that doesn't sound as familiar if I recently just said it? And you know what the Holy Spirit said to me? He said that was the way she heard it. But what God showed to me is effective witnessing. You see, it's not going to be aggressive because we're going to be pulling people and say, oh, come, come, come and return to the Lord. Come and give your life to the Lord. We, we have effective witnessing because we will have the power to demonstrate what we say. That is what's going to make it look aggressive because it's going to be effective in the mighty name of Jesus. Alan is going to come to close out the service. In fact, Alan, don't worry. I'll close the service so that we can be quick about it. But one thing that I'm going to say as we're closing the service today is this. You know when I told you that you need to find something to do so that you don't continue to occupy yourself with old habits? The Lord said to me that many people here need to start from learning to spend time just praising God. Many of us here. So if you, if you are not sure what to do, don't guess, don't Google. Just worship God. Just continue to praise God and say you're going to give yourself 45 minutes of doing nothing but just thanking Him. Every, every good thing that you can remember about what God does in the lives of men, begin to say it to Him. Call Him the healer, the provider, the lover of your soul, the faithful king, you know, the soon coming king. Just keep declaring those things. Repeat yourself if you need to, but don't stop engaging yourself in the place of praise. And you will see the presence of God become very real and tangible in your life. So I'm not going to take too much of our time. We're coming into a time of honoring the Lord with our substance. The ways to give are on the screen. It's going to stay there the rest of the service, so don't be in a hurry, but just take your time. For the word of God says, let everyone give as he has proposed in his heart, not grudgingly, nor of necessity, because God loves a cheerful giver. Give to honor God, give to support the work, give in appreciation, give because God loves a cheerful giver. Be generous in your heart toward God, toward his work, and give in his name, in Jesus' name. Now, Tuesday, we're going to be here again by the grace of God on Tuesday. I want to encourage you, come, make it a date with God, but come with something specific. Have a specific expectation. Whatever it is, make sure that you're specific. Why? So that when the Lord does it, you will know that it happened because of obedience. You will know that it happened because you were in his presence. You need to start to train your heart to identify how things work in the kingdom. So have something specific. Show up here with that specific thing. And when the Lord's done it, your heart will memorize that act. And it will yield more in obedience to God rather than in disobedience or reluctance. I'm going to say a word of prayer and we're going to close out. There is a lot more that is happening in here and... A part of me just want to stay a part of it, continuing to profess over you and make declarations. But I know that the angels of the Lord who are working on our hearts are more than equal to the task. And so let them continue to work as you go. But Revelations 21.7, I'm going to read this and we will be out of here. Revelations 21.7, I say this because of what is about to come. And you just need to ingest this into your spirit. And let it stay there. Revelation 21, 7. It says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. That word is the same as child. It will be my, it will be mine. So don't just say, Oh, you're a woman, you can't be God's son. No, we are all sons of God because we're led by the Holy Spirit. So here is the part of it that I want you to take with you. The Bible says, He who overcomes. Not everybody will overcome, but you will overcome. So I want you to start to personalize it when you remember all of what is going on in the world, when you hear things, just say to yourself, I'm one of those who overcome because God already has a plan and that plan involves that by believing in Jesus Christ and by trusting in him, we will overcome. So I will not doubt, I will not worry, I will be confident and I will remain those, I will remain part of those who 
overcome. And I want us to actually say it before we leave here today. I will overcome. No matter what happens in the world, I will overcome. In the mighty name of Jesus, I will overcome. In the mighty name of Jesus. Ah, Father, thank you. This is something that I've been waiting for. It's only going to take another 20 seconds. Remember when COVID was about to hit? Two months before COVID. The Lord told me that our meetings were going to shut down in the public place, but we're going to still meet because there was a disease coming into the world. And guess what else the Lord said? If you were there, how many people were there? Do you remember? The Lord said to bring out the oil and anoint people so that they have immunity against the fear. You understand what I mean? Because it was, the fear was the real trouble, not any virus. The virus comes and goes. It's a flu virus, but it's the fear that made the world respond the way they responded. I knew there was something. All through this service, I was pressing into something. I'm not sure if you all noticed, but I was pressing into something because I knew that there was something that was brought in here, but I didn't see it. Now I see it. God is granting to us immunity over what is coming. Something is coming, is being packaged by the dragon, delivered by the beast. It will not touch you. You see, Manuelita, now it makes sense. The passion with which you pray that the disease of the Egyptian will not come to us. It will not touch you. Just make note. Make note, it will not touch you. It will render several people paralyzed in several ways, not just physically, but also materially. But the Lord is saying, it will not touch you. Father, we thank you because this is like one of those days. <laughs> it seems like nothing's happened, but great things have happened in righteousness. Alrighty, God is good. So let's, let's quickly pray over the offerings. And I'm just going to take a moment here to give mine. And then we can be out of here. Oh, hallelujah. I like it when I feel like, when I feel sedated in God's presence. When I feel like I'm, I'm not myself. That's because heaven is working on me and doing things that don't require my attentiveness or my consciousness or my own abilities. Heaven is numbing me down so that they can lift me up. Father, we give you praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Alrighty, I promise you this is the last one. Michelle, you need to tell them. The Lord said to me, tell them. There's somebody, not just somebody, there are people. I see at least two of them. They need to hear what God has put on your heart. So tell them. So don't say, ah, I've told them before. Don't say, they should already know. When it hits you, tell them. It will save them from getting into trouble. So tell them. Once it hits you, don't assume they already know. Just tell them. And God will reveal to you who those people are because you will know as soon as you get that word. So tell them in the mighty name of Jesus, God bless you. And I will see y'all hopefully on Tuesday. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>